Hi everybody, Happy New Year! Uh, welcome back. My name is Ivan Habernal. I'll be giving the guest lecture today. Uh, since January 2021, I'm leader of uh, Trustworth, the Human Language Technologies Group. And I hope you enjoyed the last videos. And now as a proper YouTuber, I should ask if you like what you see, subscribe or give likes and comment here and so on. If you don't, that's fine too. I mean, let's move on. Where we are now in the landscape of uh, fall uh, is a little bit touchy, touching of machine learning from the user's perspective. So we'll be still using NLTK. We won't do any machine learning hardcore, but we'll be touching some classification problems on textual data. So after this lesson, you should be able to use some existing um, text classification models from LFT NLTK and let them train on some data and they will serve you. But let's, let us start with a very simple motivation example. So we want to build a model, something which learns from data, and the model should be able to predict whether a, a ball here, a dot, is either blue or red. So we have two classes, uh, blue and class one is blue, uh, class two is red. And we want to build a model that given any new any new point tells us, uh, well, it's blue or red. And for that, we need some uh, so-called training data. And this is actually what we see right here. So we see here a bunch of training data. It has a meaning here because we're looking at a two-dimensional space. So each of these tiny uh, balls or dots has something which we call a, f a feature or features and we are in the two-dimensional space, it means each of these dots has two features. One is the X coordinate and one the other is the, the Y coordinate. So they live in a vector space, in a R2 vector space, and each of them has two features. Also, each of them now, because it's training data, has the label associated with that. So we can formalize it now uh, using the proper terminology of machine learning. So these are called data points or data set, and each of them is called an instance. Somebody here also like an example in the Google's terminology, typically we call them instance. So we have sort of instances. The instances, each of them has features, and these features live in a, in our example, they live in a vector space um, of two dimensions. So each of them, again, their position here on the slide has some meaning because this has some feature x1 and, and x2 or x and y. If we say here's, a, here's the origin of the coordinate system. So here's 0, 0. Here could be 2.2 and 1.7 or something like that. And each of them have different, different coordinates as we see. So we visually see it in the training data. Also, in the training data, each of these instances has a, has a label associated with them. And in our case, the label is the actual class, so blue or red. Our goal is to, to take this training data and learn a function or a model that tells us if we give it a new, new ball without knowing whether it's red and blue, it will say, well, this is red and blue, it will predict the class we want to predict. Since we are in the in two-dimensional space, so we can apply some knowledge from linear, linear algebra, and we might say what the, you know, what the function could be, what the model could learn, we could say, well, if you want to distinguish something on, in two, dim two dimensions, well, maybe just draw the line. And this is what we are trying here very naively, say, okay, there's, there is a line, the function is the line and it's saying everything which is above the line is red and everything which is below the line is blue. It's a very simple model. So we can formalize it if this were a x and it, this is the y axis. We have a function, linear function, y equals some coefficients time x plus some bias b. So it's a, it's a function of a line. 
It's a very simple classifier. Now you see, well, okay, this is not perfect. It's, it's somehow, if we are able to train this line from this data, still there are some, you know, as you see, well, this could be problematic. So we'll get to this one uh, just in a second. But now imagine we train this model and we know this line. So now we're saying everything which is above is red and everything which is below is blue and comes a new, uh, new point which we want to predict the color or the class of. So given our function, this is above the line and it should be red. So we say it's red. But coming back to, these, uh, to this tiny little guy here, we had this line, uh, which we call uh, a linear model in two dimensions, because it's just a line we might be saying, well, okay, maybe the line is not really enough. Maybe we need uh, something more powerful. Maybe we need to learn some curve, some polynomial, something more complicated that would really care of all these instances. So it would train like with 100% accuracy on the training data, it would learn everything. That's correct, but it comes uh, with a couple of caveats. So all these issues, why not to have like 100% accuracy on training data and have very complicated model, it's more uh, to machine learning than to our lecture today. But very generally, uh, we want our model not only to, to remember all the training data and to be able to, pro um, to predict 100% accuracy on the training data, we also want it to be general enough. So if you remember all your training data and comes a new instance, then you might, your model could be overtrained or um, could be overfitted, so to say. And then it won't be performing very well on some new classes because it just remembers all the data and it's very complicated. So there's, there's a trade-off in the theory of machine learning. There's a trade-off between the complexity of the model and um, the generalization and it's sort of an art to really choose a model that is able to generalize well because this is what we want we want to automatize something and we want to work it not on the training data but on some data that is coming without labels and we, we want to predict it so i think this is for now everything we need to know about supervised learning we have training data instances we want to learn a model so in this lecture, we won't be doing the actual math behind machine learning and supervised machine learning. We will be using that, but just what we need to remember is that each model we are using for uh, classification is has some meaning in terms of their its qualities. So if we say it's a linear model, then you can understand it as, okay, well, there's a line somewhere drawn in the feature space. We say, well, this is more complicated model, maybe a neural network, which can work with the uh, with um, more complicated feature spaces by using some nonlinear functions in there, then it's much more you know, it's much more powerful. But maybe it needs more data. So there's always you know we need to choose uh, wisely which model we want to use for our problem to solve. Another task in instances and features and machine learning is where we don't have any labels. So for example, here we have just a bunch of dots, they're all gray, and we don't know anything, anything more about them. So what can we do with that? Can we learn something from that? And the answer is yes. So we might want to maybe cluster them. So assign a label to each of them just by looking at some properties of the feature space. And here, as you see, very somehow, um, very naive approach would be, well, we just, you know, draw circles or ellipses around each of them. And then we would end up with one, two, three, four clusters. And the properties of these clusters are, well, all these instances in the cluster are somehow close. So they might be sharing some, some commonalities. As you see, it doesn't really reflect one-to-one -one our classes, red and blue as we have, but it also it is some other meaningful representation of the data or assigning some labels. And the advantage of this clustering is that we don't need any label data. So we don't have to give in the advance in them. We don't have to give in advance all those labels to the data. It just learns somehow 
from the data itself by clustering. So after a very short introduction to supervised machine learning and clustering, <laughs> we'll come to the heart of this lecture, which is uh, applying models from supervised machine learning to textual data. And we'll be talking about classification and what is important, how to represent our text as a set of features in order to learn some model that could classify things. And we'll be using uh, models or you know, families of models from the NLTK framework. So now we are going to a little bit formalize the classification task and its different variants. So first, classification is the task of choosing a class label for a given instance based on its features. So in text data, one typical example could be uh, classifying whether an email is a spam or not, because we have uh, email as a text and two classes, and we can train a model and do this classification. Or we want to classify a news article by uh, its category in the newspaper. We have different variants for classification. And basically, if we have two only two classes, as we saw with the blue and red dots, or spam or non-spam, we have binary class classification or binary classification. Or we can have multiple classes, as for example in the uh, in the topic of newspapers classification, and we then talk about multi-class classification. And also we can this multi-class uh, problem we can somehow work it around and represent as a set of binary tasks. We also so far we have seen uh, a single label classification, which means each instance has only one label. It's either red or blue. There could be tasks, however, where we could have um, a set of labels and an instance could be anything from the set of labels. So, for example, in, a top in this topic classification from newspapers, one article could be both an opinion article and a sports article. If somebody is complaining about uh, Eintracht Frankfurt from last night, so it could be both sports and opinion. So then we talk about multiple class classification. Multiple class classification is harder because the, the, you know, the model needs to learn not only one class, but multiple at the same time and predict them at, at the same time. So typically, typically we uh, encounter single label classification. One speciality in text processing is sequence classification, which we understand as a, so we have a sequence of instances and we want to predict classes for each of them uh, for the whole sequence. So it could be, for example, uh, part of speech tagging, as we already saw in previous uh, lectures, so part of speech tagging is a sequence of words and each of these instances is associated with a, with a label, so we want to predict all of them and we can do it such that we predict all of them at once. So then we classify the whole sequence. We can formally describe the supervised classification problem uh, as follows. So for supervised classification, we have something called the training data. These are the dots we saw in the, in the motivation example. And each of the input has some label and we need to uh, somehow from the input extract the features. In the example with the, with the dots, we already somehow had these features implicitly, so these were the coordinates x and y. But for example, if your input is a document, what are the features of a document? I mean, is it how can you interpret or express your document as, in terms of some, some features where you can learn function? So this is the art of feature extraction from text, which we'll be talking about later. But now, given we have this feature extractor and we can represent the document as a feature vector or feature tuple, a list of features. Then our machine learning algorithm takes this feature representation and the label for each instance and learn the model, learn some parameters. For example, it learns the slope of the curve or something more complicated. Then in the prediction time, we have again an input document, but now we don't have any label. This is something which we want to predict, but we need the same feature extra extractor. So again, this has to be the very same thing, taking a document and extracting some features 
they have to live in the same vector space, for example. So we need to make sure that the feature extractor is the same for training and for prediction, which turns it into features and then the model which is already learned and knows all the parameters, will predict, well, okay, this point is above the line here, so it's a thread dot, or more complicated function evaluated, which predicts a probability of the class, for example. And it will spit out a label for this new data, which we want to uh, predict. We can split this task of training and prediction into several, several subtasks, which need... Um, which need some care and some proper design. So the first one is when, where actually our training data coming from. So what is our training data? What are the labels? I mean, do we need to manually create the labels or somebody has done it before? Or is it something we just grab from the internet, so to say, and we will some noisy labels. So there are different sorts of uh, where to get training data and, and also their quality and size have strong impact on the uh, on the performance of the model. So this is something which we need to really you know take into consideration. The second one is, as I mentioned already, is how actually are we going to represent our text as a set of features? Because text is something like we read and understand, but as we saw, the model needs something, some numbers, some feature vectors. So how are we going to transfer, transfer or transport uh, from the document to the features is another sort of art. Then we need to select the proper model because some models might be super easy like the linear model or uh, some, some line, but maybe it's just not expressive enough for the problem we have. Maybe our problem is life lives in a super highly dimensional space and we need something more powerful. So we need to choose the machine learning algorithm and we need to know what a machine learning algorithm, what, what its pros and cons are. And well, we're not finished yet because we want to also understand how, how good the model is. You know? Is it like, is it performing on 100% accuracy? Then well, okay, well, we're good. Or 90%. If it's performing 50% accuracy on some binary tasks, so if our algorithm uh, for this um, red and blue dots, if it were predicting with accuracy 50%, it's just random, so maybe it's not learning anything. So we need to really properly evaluate the algorithm and do some error analysis. So we will now go through an example of classifying movie reviews and their associated sentiment or polarity. And I'm pretty sure you've seen this task already. It's a classical one and it's a very nice one showing how to do a supervised classification. So let's say we have in the NLTK corpus, we have some movie reviews, uh, which are textual data, and there are some metadata associated with these movie reviews, such as the category. So we want to predict the category of the movie review. And we are basically, this is building our training data. So it'll be a, a tuples of, of the words and their associated categories. Now comes the question how to extract uh, the actual features from the document. So we're in Python, so we write a function for that. And now the very simple function or the very simple feature extractor could be, well, a feature of the document, something which describes the document could be its length. It's very simple. It's just a number of characters. So here, basically, it's taking the, the document and it's returning the length in characters. What we are returning here is also the name of the feature because we want, you know, the f each feature has its own, so to say, dimension in the dimensionals in the feature space, and we cannot just mix them up. So each feature has to have a certain dimension. In the dots example, we were using x x1 or x2 or x and y um, coordinates. Now we can give it basically names like document length. So we also know which features are important later on and we can examine the model. So a question you might be asking, what, what should be the, the feature values? I mean, are we restricted to real numbers? Are we restricted to some categories or are we restricted? So what, what it could be? 
And it's basically our design choice. So, and it needs to also work well with the actual machine learning algorithm. But basically, the features could be some real numbers, as we have with the dots. So typically, machine learning algorithms are sort of uh, feature values agnostic, mostly. Uh, but sometimes the features, so sometimes it helps the model to have features only 0 or 1. Sometimes it could be a continuous value. So it really depends on the, it, it depends on what you're trying to express with the feature, whether uh, it's better to have some large values and, and uh, real numbers. Sometimes, it, for example, the feature could be, is word A present in the text 0 or 1? So it's called a it's called a binary feature. So it really depends on your, you know, what the features are capturing and how do you want to model it. For example, in, in this document length, we somehow assume this feature is, uh, is a positive integer between maybe one and the longest document. Now, given the training data and the feature extractor, what we need to also think about or what we need to take care of is not using all the data for training and for prediction or evaluation. So we should never evaluate our algorithms on the training data. Why? Well, because if you have like a very powerful model, it could remember all the training data, all the training instances with their labels. And then if you ask, you know, if you give the same example again for prediction, it will just pulls it from the you know from its memory and say like well you know I, I've seen that before so this is class A or B or C and you can get like 100% accuracy on your training data but then if you use the model for prediction it could be a disaster so how can we go about it is to sp split your data sets your data set into something which you only use for training and playing around and parameter estimation and hyperparameters and so on. And then to have a separate test set where you actually, at the end of the day, having here all fixed, where you uh, evaluate your argo algorithm properly or your model. And we have also some subclasses here in the, in the development set. Uh, so we call it like development and train set. And one is the actual training. There, there could be smaller dev test set where you can tune some hyperparameters of the model, but then there's a test set. So the rule of, th rule of thumb is while you are developing your feature extractors and choose your model and so on, never touch the test set. You know, Just leave it, leave it somewhere else. Just don't touch it. Don't look at it. Don't try to run your algorithms. I mean, it could be tempting if you own the data because then you might, you know, get better results, but you also like start overfitting to the test set and it's a bad thing. So you shouldn't be doing that. Split the data into training and dev set, and then you keep your test set on site. And only at the end of the day, just evaluate your algorithm there and report the results and uh, look at errors. You are free to choose where you want to split your data. So it could be at the very beginning where you split your documents as we just saw in the previous slide, or you might do it after extracting the features and then splitting your feature vectors into train, dev and test. Um, it's basically up to you what's what's better. If the feature extraction takes time, you might want, you might want to do it just once and then split the extracted features already. If feature extraction is part of your game, uh, you might want to split the raw documents and then keep it keep the test data somewhere else and then run your feature extractors on the training data iteratively. So now comes the fun part where you have your training data and their, tra uh, their features extracted and you want to train the actual uh, machine learning model, train it on the data. In NLTK, many things are out of box prepared. So for example, we want to work with a naive bias classifier and just it's a one-liner here to train a classifier by, by calling method train. It will learn its parameters given your training data. As we have seen already, there are many classifiers available and uh, they have different you know, representation, representational power. So 
in this case, naive bias classifier, it's a very simplistic model. It comes with a lot of assumption. One of these assumptions is like is that um, the features are conditionally independent. So you can model it very easily and building actually naive bias classifier model from scratch, it's, um, it's quite easy. It's a couple of lines and just you're basically counting occurrences of your features in your training data. It's easy. Uh, there could be other models we can, uh, we can try. Typically, you know, naive base classifier is some meaningful baseline, you know, which shows like you shouldn't be, if you develop a new model, it shouldn't be worse than uh, performing with naive base classifier, you know, because then it's really like a, the, the base, base, base baseline. And these algorithms in NLTK, they have some um, sort of interface, although in Python there's no interfaces, but they share some, some common methods which is the method called train and the data sets coming in into the format of, uh, of what we just saw in the training set. And having the model trained, uh, we want to give it some examples and predict them. So we have this um, test data features and we take uh, this document with this, uh, with this ID or with position in the, in the list of documents they had to get the features and let it classify and it should spit out the predicted label. We also know because we have the data are labeled, so we, we are in super, supervised classification, we know what the real label is. So it allows us to compare the actual label and what the model predicts in order to evaluate the model. We don't have to do the evaluation by hand. Um, we can compute different scores for evaluation, and one of them is typically accuracy. So it's uh, it's a mismatch between. It's saying like from all the predictions, how many? What what's the percentage of them that got it right? So if we are predicting uh, the blue and red, so it would say like how how many times we had a match and mismatch, and its accuracy is then a ratio or uh, or a fraction between zero and, and one. And you can say in, in percent, so if you have accuracy 100%, it means all, all these examples were correct. If you have accuracy of 50% and your task is a binary one and the data sets are equally split in size, so 50% accuracy, it's, a, it's random. So if your algorithm is performing 50% accuracy on your equal balanced data in a binary task, then it's just not learning anything, it's just random. If it's worse than 50%, there is something super wrong with your algorithm or feature, so you might want to look into that, what's going wrong there. Anyway, so NLTK is, um, is offering all these metrics automatically, so we can run um, the accuracy function here and give it a classifier and some dev set, and it will compute, or it will run the classifier on the dev set, and will collect the predicted results and compare and predict the, the actual accuracy on the dev set. The features we've seen so far, or we designed so far, the length of the document might not be the, the best one to get our job done. So for example, for classifying whether a document is positive or negative, or whether the movie reviews actually writing positively saying, well, the film is good, or the film is like total crap and you shouldn't watch it at no cost. Um, the length of the review, well, it, perhaps it doesn't play a role. It could, but perhaps not. What matters more is maybe the actual content. And now it comes the art of choosing the right features. So what we want to do is to extract features that are meaningful for the task at hand. So maybe length of the document it might bring some information for the classification between positive or negative reviews of movies. Maybe not, there could be some other ones. So we need to, here it comes in the so-called feature engineering where we need to think of which features are important and how to extract them and so on. Of course, there are some better methods to learn the features automatically just from the raw text. And this is the, the whole field of deep learning in natural language processing uh, or computer vision is to learn the features or the rep representation automatically from tons of data. But now we are doing simpler model and uh, we want to extract the features that have some linguistic meaning and we want to engineer them manually. 
So if we have too many features, uh, there we might come into problems of there, you know, if we have correlated features, some classifiers might not really work with that. Some classifiers might easily ignore correlated features and we might easily overfit. Also, it depends on the, whether the features are shared, uh, whether the feature spaces are similar in our training data, in our test data. So we want to have them, these sort of uh, feature spaces or distributions of features similar or as close, to as close as possible. So we learn meaning for features and we can expect these same features uh, while predicting. So a little bit of taste of feature engineering is that you start maybe with many features, run your um, classifier on the, on the training and dev data. And if you see like, well, maybe it's overfitting already or it's not really working well, you remove some features and it's called feature ablation. So you might want to remove uh, one, let's say subset of features and keep the other, which makes more meaning and so on. So it's really, like, it's feature engineering for a good way. It's engineering. So it could be art, intuition, and a lot of work around to really find meaningful features. And also it includes maybe looking into the actual model, what a model is learning and whether we can see whether some features are more informative than the others. And NLTK does support that. So you might want to look into the models and see that for example, features. Um, so if we have feature as a presence of a word then, or contains word. So this is the name of the feature. So if a movie contains word waste, and if this feature is true, so we have binary features, then it's more towards a negative label. So it will be negative re review. Makes sense. So if we have, well, watching this movie was a waste of time. And this is the worst, you know, this is the, 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 wor the word waste appears there. It's perhaps more negative. Not 100%, but this feature is really helping us. The same for ridicules. So it's associated with the negative class. Desires, interesting, it's more positive. So we, you know, for some of the features, we might not have like good intuition. Some of them really make sense. Some of them like finger, why? Maybe finger weg in German, I'm not sure. I don't really know. So, but it might be really helpful to look into the actual model to see which features play a role and in the process of feature engineering. And we might do some more detailed error analysis, which is actually looking and the wrong predictions. So we take the full document, which is predicted wrongly, and we just read the review. And we look at the features associated with, the, with, this, with this document and try to find some, some patterns and try to reveal, maybe these features are not really working for this type of data because I have something maybe like negation in the text. So I might need a negation in the features as well. So if you say not good, like two words, not good, the, the movie was not good, and your features only capture presence of a single word, good. So it might be saying, well, this review is really good, it's, it's positive because there's a word good, but in the original it was not good. So you might want to extend your features to capture um, so-called bigrams, so you know, two consecutive words. And then not good would be learned as something which is not positive, but rather negative. So I think it's a good time to move on to some uh, typical examples of using classification for some uh, NLP problems. And here we will be building um, a part of speech tagger by using features um, based on the ending of the suffixes of words. So what we're gonna start with is to have some, um, some typical suffixes. So we want to create first our feature space because we don't have any features, uh, we don't have any meaning of them. So we want to collect the feature space from the training data. So we take all the words, lowercase, and uh, collect, collect the suffixes in a dictionaries where the key is the, uh, the actual suffix. So for example, this one would be the, the actual word, so we're iterating, iterating over words, and here the word, the word's uh, last character will be uh, the key of this dictionary, and we'll just uh, add the counter plus one. So we're basically counting all the various suffixes from length one, 
two and three. And we take the most common hundred ones. So why are we doing this actually? Is uh, we want to collect features, but we also want some features that are somehow common. So if we have a feature that just occurs once in the training data, well, maybe it's not a really important feature, it's just some, you know, some artifact somewhere, something which is not really important for the task. If we have features that are most common, more common to different classes as well, then it might be, it might bring some information for, uh, for the actual decision learned. So we take like 100, uh, 100 common features and leave out the, the features with uh, fewer occurrences. And we say, well, it's noise, we just don't care about them. Maybe the most 100 ones uh, are important. So now we have um, all the, f the feature space uh, in, in a dictionary called common suffixes. And now we want to extract, we build a feature extractor here. This is the function for the feature extractor, where the instance is the word, and we actually, um, now we're going through all the feature, uh, all the possible features. And if this word matches one of these you know, 100 features, we add it to the actual extracted features. So for example, if the word ends, so we're, okay, let's do it differently. We're going through the common suffixes. Now the common suffix would be S. And if our word ends with the suffix ends with s, then we add ends with s to the features as a as a value as one. So we have now the the feature space. So these are the most common features which we learned on some data from Brown Corpus. Then we have a function which is the feature extractor. So given a instance a word, it says whether the word ends with any of these most common features. Now we want to train the classifier and test it and actually choose the classifier because we don't know it yet. Uh, we don't have one yet. So here we take some already tagged words. So we, want, we are doing supervised learning. So tagged words, uh, it's coming from the Brown corpus and they already have part of speech text and we're taking the news here. So here, basically, we're building the training set and the test set from uh, the extracted features and the labels. Here, we want to choose a classifier and we're taking, so we could do, we could take any. We're here, we're taking the decision tree classifier, which we will show a little bit later in detail why this might be interesting. But basically, it could be also the naive base classifier we've seen before, because the training works roughly the same, or the has same API at least. So we train the classifier as we've already seen before, and uh, run it on the test set, and we get a accuracy of 62%. Is it good? Is it bad? It depends on your use case. You know, it could be definitely better, but it depends also on the on the number of classes because part of speech tagging, it's not binary, we have multiple classes. It depends also on the distribution of the sizes of, for each actual class, because accuracy sort of um, follows the distribution of the labels. So you need really, really to understand um, what this accuracy means and how the classes and their data are distributed and their sizes to draw some conclusion whether this is good or bad. And here we can run um, to classify, basically, to, classify, to predict a part of speech on, on a word. And here we try cats, and it says it's noun plural. Why decision tree might be interesting is that really it allows us to inspect the actual decisions. So decision tree is sort of a tree of a binary tree of if and else. So a classic, I mean, you can exp express a function deciding based on features as a if or else. And then we see here, it starts with checking whether um, the instance or whether the feature ends with the is false. Then you check another, whether the suffix is S, 
and if not then if the suffix is a comma then you get a class comma or here if it ends with s and if it's end with apostrophe s then it's a some noun phrase in plural um sorry it's a it's this class nps and so on. So this could be the advantage of, uh, of decision tree that you can inspect uh, in detail what the actual decisions are. So far, we had only features that are coming from the actual instance from a single word, but nothing actually is preventing us from using the context of the words because it's carrying some important information as well. And it might be uh, helping us for, you know, in order to get a better predictions of our, of our part of speech text. So, for example, we might look into the previous word and extract some, you know, some features from it or, well, either extract features from the previous word or using the actual previous word as a feature. So we would see here if, you know, the, the feature would be now if the previous word was a n and then we have all the other features that we know already suffix, suffix, suffix. So it's given more context and it's giving more information for the classifier to learn and hopefully predicting better. And we can also, of course, I mean, if we add more features, we can evaluate it. So here's the example as we saw before, but now with the extended uh, contextual features. And when we look at the, the accuracy of the results, then we see, okay, from 67, we went up to 78. So in this case, on this data set, this particular feature for this task is helpful and it's bringing our more uh, powerful algorithm with better accuracy. And here's the last example of using classification for a, a NLP task. Here we are, want to segment sentences uh, using a classifier. So you might remember the lecture on raw data processing where we use some very simple segmentation into sentences. We could use regular expressions, but we might also actually train a classifier and learn uh, the segmenter from the data. So we want to, how, how can we approach this? How can we model this? So we can use uh, the existing sentences from, uh, from the data set, which is a tree bank so it has a special meaning for dependency parsing, but there's also like sentences. So we have somewhere in the corpus already split sentences. What we are going to do is we concatenate everything. So all the tokens from all the sentences into one large list. So this will be the tokens. And we are going through, we also want to remember where the boundaries of um, of the actual sentences were. So this is some sort of counter of the offset. And we're going through all the sentences. Uh, sentence is a is a list of tokens and we're adding them to the actual tokens here. And here we're um, increasing the size of the offset. So the boundaries is simply for the boundaries, we're setting just the offset of the of the splits between the sentences as we go. Now, how our feature extractor looks like is that we're given a list of tokens now, and we're extracting basically four features. So, one is uh, whether the next word. So, and excuse me. So we have a list of tokens and a position in the tokens, and one feature is whether the next token is capitalized. So we're saying, okay, is this next token upper? Is it capital word or not? Uh, we have a, we collect the previous word and this is the feature. So the, not whether this is capitalized or not, but the actual word is the feature. And we're collecting uh, this actual token at position Y and also one feature is whether the size of the previous token is one. So it might be interesting also feature. And then we want to extract features for, uh, for all functions, all possible punctuation symbols. So we're interested in predicting whether dot or exclamation mark or question mark 
our actual uh, sentence boundaries or not. So we're going through all the tokens, but only for those where we have the token is either one of these three, and for only these, we extract the features. So again, we're going through the list of all concatenated sentences, and then once we step onto a dot, we extract these features. So we're asking whether the previous is a word, its length, whether the next word is capitalized, and the actual punctuation. And this will help us to create a data set of um, basically a labeled data set. In order to evaluate our classifier, we're splitting our uh, feature sets, so the extracted training, training instances in terms of features and the labels into you know, 90 percent, and then the rest test percent will be the test set. And here we choose the naive bias classifier. I mean, it's up to us to decide which classifier we want. So we might we might be fine as well with um, decision tree classifier. The naive bias classifier could be working as well. We can try other ones. And if we classify the accuracy of our segmenter, it's ninety three percent. And again, the question you know is whether it's good enough or not. Well, we should compare it to maybe some other baselines which are not trained used, uh, which are not trained on data, but could be like regular expressions. And then we might make a choice whether we want to really use in production uh, for uh, suggesting whether this is a sentence split or not. So what is the take home message uh, of classification or text classification? So classification is a very general machine learning uh, workflow. And we were talking about supervised classification mostly where we have training data and labels. And there are several steps we are talking about being feature selection or feature extraction or feature design, sort of, you know, engineering which features, then how to extract them from the data. And then how can we interpret the results and whether it's, you know, how important it is to actually do some error analysis to look at your, the prediction uh, capabilities of the features and the false predictions to understand whether it could be improved and how it could be improved. And we also introduced uh, the decision tree, which is a you know, tree of if-else decisions on the features, but also naive, bi uh, naive bias is another classifier we are using, not explaining how it works. And so it's a different sort of model. And the very important part is splitting your data set or corpus into training and development and then the test set and never trying to do any iterative work on the test set because then you would be overfitting on the test set and it doesn't tell you how well it works in practice. Text classification has numerous applications, you know, from spam classifications, typical one, I guess like every, uh, every email client offline has it somehow uh, built in. So if you know Thunderbird or Evolution or other clients which work locally, many of them have some spam classifier as well. And typically these are some naive based classifiers built on some training data. You know, uh, if you have some email classification in your, um, on your provider, they'll be using similar tools as well. And other language identification. So what is the language of the document? It looks easy, but it could be really challenging if you really want to go into the details and what makes one language and how different they are. So building very well-performing language classifier is not a trivial task. I mean, it sort of seems to be solved. And as we just saw, you know, the segmenter or tokenizer could be also data-driven and there are always some challenges. So, you know, rarely we see models trained on uh, natural language working 100% correctly because language is ambiguous and sometimes hard to grasp. So there could be some errors. There are other use cases uh, and other techniques which we'll be covering in, uh, in the next lesson. So before I say goodbye for today, uh, here are some links where you can look into more details. If you're interested more into machine learning, I would, I would really recommend uh, Chris Bishop's book where you can really understand the, the mathematics behind machine learning. There is, there's numerous books on machine learnings and I'm pretty sure, you know, at TU Darmstadt we have some courses on machine learning and so on. So 
you know, if you're interested in, in how it works under the hoods, just go grab some and, and, and learn it. It's really important. And uh, we have some uh, existing libraries, so such as NLTK, but there uh, used to be a Java library, Veka, and they have very good um, documentation explaining how the, uh, how the models work. Uh, scikit-learn is another Python library with very good documentation and, and a bunch of different classifiers that just work out of box and a lot of, so to say, data science applications uh, could be solved by using scikit-learn, for example. So thanks for watching. We're at the end of this lecture. If you like what you see, subscribe or give a like or, well, just if we have questions, just comment here. I mean, you can do it in the Moodle forum or maybe you can do it here in in YouTube and I'll be I'll, I'll try to answer either here or there and to clarify um, any questions you might have so thanks and see you next time